<laughs> and I love you. <laughs> Do you know how great it is to be back here? Ah, I love this community. It means so much to me, and I'm just so grateful that I get to be here and, and share some thoughts with you. My husband and our daughters and I have moved back here to be with my parents, who two are my best friends, and, and my five brothers and sisters who are all having babies. It's just a really good time <laughs> to be here, and it's very snowy in Colorado, so oh, I'm delighted. So happy December. Can you even believe it's December? We were just barbecuing for the 4th of July five minutes ago. I don't know. I, uh, it, it's just um, blustery, but not too blustery for me, which is nice. And of course, tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. So again, a very happy Hanukkah to uh, all of our sisters and brothers around the globe who celebrate this festival of lights. And as the days get darker, here in this month of December, and we move into this season of light, I thought we would take this opportunity to look at how we can recognize the light within ourselves in an even greater way and shine it into the world. How does that sound? All right, good. All right, you're with me. Yes. So in talking about light today, I want to be sure that we have the same working definition. So, so the inner light I'm talking about, it's nothing woo-woo. It's not, you know, about some old guy in a, with a long beard in a cloud saying, let there be light out there. It is not that at all. In fact, I am talking about our inner light. And in the science of mind, we teach that this light is not something that we create or that we can borrow from another human being, um, or that we attain from outside of ourselves. Rather, we teach that this light is already within us. Ernest Holmes said, each of us has been furnished with a divine torch whose wick burns from the oil of the eternal. And you know, for those of you who like trivia, interestingly, this term, inner light, as being the internal experience of God, was actually coined way back in 1624 in England by George Fox, who was the founder of the Quakers. He felt, way back in 1624, that an inner relationship with the divine was much more meaningful than an impersonal one with a God far away. Sound familiar? Yes. So we, we feel this presence, this inner light, this lightness, which I also like to call godness, when we are around the joy of little children, when we are in nature, when we are with our fur babies, our beloved pets, when we're in that, when we're in that creative flow of something that we are creating that's coming through us. We feel this when we are doing work we love. We feel this inner light when we experience art in all of its beautiful forms. I certainly felt it when Gia was just singing now. How marvelous was that? This light is, is felt when, when we feel a deep compassion for someone in some situation that they might be moving through. This inner light lives and breathes at the center of each one of us. And you know, modern science tells us that everything on the planet and beyond is a vibration of some kind. Everything, everything around you is made up of vibrating particles and energy. And we instinctively know when that energy is light because it makes us feel lighter. It makes us feel joyous. It makes us feel happy. It makes us feel loving. And because we teach that we are all connected, we feel this same light or love energy from those around us. We feel this symbiotic, beautiful energy. We feel it when we're being supported and really listened to by a loved one, or maybe a practitioner or a therapist, or when we experience the love of caregivers or people in organizations that do good work in the world, you know? We hear these wonderful stories and we feel it. So this inner light, or God's love, which lives at the center of every single being, whether they know it or not, that is important, 
It is the collective light that we have an opportunity, that we get to share as the one human family that we are. And this is the absolute most true thing about us, is this indwelling inner light. But, you know, we can't really, really have a meaningful conversation about the light without also acknowledging darkness. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Many of us have negative connotations about darkness. Maybe we were scared of the dark as kids or, or you know, dang it, those scary movies. You know, they always have some monster that comes out in the middle of the night. That's what did it for me. I, that, no good. So unfortunately, darkness gets a bad rap. But just like the working definition that we are using for inner light today, when I'm referring to this concept or this idea of darkness, what I am really talking about is challenge, difficulty, fear, and pain. And in my spiritual counseling practice, I am working with a lot of folks right now that are feeling challenged with all that they're seeing in the news, in social media, all that's happening in our environment, with all that is going on, many, many people are struggling with feeling somewhat separate from this light. And then, you know, uh, that combined with the fact that we're now moving into the holiday season, which can for some people also be challenging, it can be a lot. It can feel like a lot right now. And I thought that I would take all of this and actually share some good news about this with you. How does that sound? All right. So there are so many rich stories, rich and beautiful stories in, and dramatic stories in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament about this concept of darkness. In Isaiah 45, it says, I will give you hidden treasures in the dark. If you think about the creation story, in Genesis, in the beginning, everything was made by God out of the darkness. Then, in the book of Exodus, God promises to come to Moses on Mount Sinai in a dense or dark cloud. Huh? What? God comes to Moses in a dense or dark cloud. Jacob wrestles an angel in the middle of the night. The angels announce the birth of the Christ to the shepherds at night. Throughout all of these ancient stories... God, spirit, divine light is always present within the darkness. And yet, we can forget this when we are moving through our own darkness or challenge. Take, for example, I think something we can all relate to, the concept of failure. So many of us are afraid of failing. So much so that often we unconsciously hold ourselves back from a greater experience of light in our lives to you know, sort of protect ourselves from that experience of failure. We can easily equate failing at something as something bad or wrong. Now, to be sure, failing at anything is not a walk in the park. <laughs> But I think we have a tendency, sometimes some of us, to miss the blessings and the opportunities inherent in our failures and our mistakes. And the thing is, you know, we humans, we, we make mistakes because we're human. It's a human thing. And so it's really, really important that as we navigate this terrain of life and when we make a mistake or we just plain mess up, we own it, we make amends. That's the very first step, is to own it and make amends. But then, 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 hear me. Then it is about taking that experience and allowing it to grow us. Whatever that experience of darkness is, allowing it to grow us. And this is the critical moment that so often we miss. Because, you know, golly, we can fall down that rabbit hole of blame, shame, and regret. And honey, that is a whole lot of drama. And a lot of times, it can last a long time. 
The first century Jewish mystic Rebbe Akiva said, no matter the circumstance, this too for the good. In Hebrew, it's gamzula tova, this too for the good. So, uh, you know, what if, just what if, we didn't think of failure as darkness, but rather the fertile ground for growth or positive change or good? I mean, what if we just flipped that? Think of it, think of it like this. Think of it like a seed that's planted in the dark earth. At first, it doesn't seem like much, but with patience and care, pretty soon, you have this thriving, beautiful, gorgeous orange tree. You've got lots of orange trees here in Southern California. You've got this orange tree out of the darkness that you can nourish yourselves and others around you with. Mother Nature's spirit pre-programmed, if you will, that one single seed, in a sense, to be receptive to the light, even when it is deep in the darkness of the earth. The seed has the natural impulse to grow. But if we stay in that dark place, right, the place of negativity, where we just want to complain and lament and make excuses, then we've lost that divine opportunity to grow, to let that darkness grow us. And you know, sometimes life is just there's just rough patches. It's the human experience that we all have. It's part of being here. But I'll tell you, it becomes so much easier when we choose to wake up in the midst of whatever challenge we may be going through and find that crack, that crack, as Leonard Cohen said, where the light gets in. You have a divine invitation just by being who you are to name, to name whatever it is that is challenging you. We must name something to transcend it. We name something to transcend it, and then the invitation continues. And that invitation is then we metaphorically place that on our altar to be altered. There's an old Sufi story I love, and it's about a woman who is traveling, and she becomes very, very thirsty. And she's delighted when she finally hears the trickling water, and she follows the sound for quite a ways, only to discover that that water, that trickling, is actually a muddy stream. And she can't drink from it. It would make her sick. But she knows she must have water to survive. And so as exhausted and as thirsty as she is, she follows that muddy stream for miles and miles and miles until eventually she sees that it leads into a cave. Now she's alone, and the cave is dark, and it's ominous looking. And she has no idea what is inside that cave. But in order to survive, she knows that she must follow that muddy stream to its source. And so she summons all of her strength and her courage. And she lights her lantern that she has with her, and she holds it in front of her. And sure enough, almost as soon as she walks into that cave, she discovers that the lantern illuminates that darkness, and in fact, the walls of the cave are lined with stunning, beautiful, beautifully colored crystals, and she is completely safe. And at the heart of that dark cave is the source of clean, clear water, and she has saved herself from certain death. Carl Jung said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. This is our call, to make the darkness conscious. 
So I ask you, where in your life might you still be drinking muddy water? Perhaps for you, it's a cave that looks like forgiveness of yourself or another person or unforgiveness. Or maybe, maybe it's a leap of faith to possibly begin a new job or a career or relationship. Or perhaps it is to complete a job or career or relationship that is no longer serving you. Or maybe, maybe you're looking at a cave that just simply promises greater peace if you once and for all release resentment or anger that you've been carrying around. Whatever it is for you, whatever it is for you, the divine promise is that source at the center of the cave. There is always, always, always God, love, inner light at the center of everything and every situation. And it stands at the ready for each one of us. In Buddhism, it's the idea uh, to be a lamp unto yourself. It's the same idea. You know, I was thinking about this talk this morning and this not so uh, far off memory popped into my mind to share with you. And, 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 And it's one of the most impactful experiences I've ever had in my life. I was given the honor, the absolute honor, to be present with my sister Kelly when she gave birth. And those of you who are in the birthing field, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. My sister had been such a courageous champ through the labor. You know, she just was doing great. I mean, really just riding those waves and doing really, really well until the very, very end when her pain level became, let's just say, exponentially heightened. it was very noticeably elevated, her pain. I mean, all of a sudden, it was very, very clear that she would reached a 10. Her body started shaking, and she even said, which is so uncharacteristic of her, she's been going here for 10 years, just so you know. She said, uh, she said, I can't do this. It hurts too much. She's right, right there, ready to give birth. I can't do this. It hurts too much. And right at that moment, I could not help but notice that all of the you know, professionals, professionals in the room, the, her midwife and the nurses and the doula, they all kind of sprung into action and they got very excited. But it wasn't a bad excited. It was a good excited. And it was such a complete juxtaposition between her very heightened pain and their joyous anticipation because they knew they knew what was happening. And just like that, they, they all sprung into action, beautifully supporting her with skill and assuredness and compassion because they knew. You know that old proverb, it's darkest before the dawn? They knew. They knew that it was time and then it happened. And my niece my angel niece Vivian was born into this world. And the room got lighter. I feel in my bones that this is how God is for us. That when we are ready to step into something new and it's hard or challenging or difficult or we're afraid, Universe, the universe, God, spirit, source, quantum consciousness, whatever you want to call it, rushes in to support us, to hold us, you know? So, so whatever it is that you want to develop or create or bring into your life, whatever that is wanting to be born from within you, just know, just know that it will be a gift to the world in some way and that spirit is right there to fully, fully support you. Just like Kelly's extraordinary birth team, I believe that we are here to shine our light for others. Did you know that in the Rastafarian language, there is no word that actually translates sufficiently as you and I? They don't have you or the idea of other in the Rastafarian language. What they have is I and I. I and I. 
when we eliminate the concept of the other or us or them, we walk in the world differently. Twelve years ago, there was a man named Blake Mykoski who was traveling in Argentina, and he noticed that many of the children there had no shoes, and this really, really bothered him. So when he got back to the States, he came up with a very simple idea in his apartment. And the idea was to create a shoe, a shoe company, based on the idea that if they were to sell one pair of shoes today, they would give a pair of shoes away tomorrow. He named his company Tom's. You know, Tom's shoes. It was actually supposed to say tomorrow's shoes, but they couldn't fit it on the back of the <laughs> tag on the shoe. So it became Tom's. But here's the part that I love the most about this story. And he said this recently in an interview, that as soon as he put the intention out into the world and gave people a real tangible opportunity to be givers and to use their money for good, people showed up. The company was established and built, and to date, Tom's has given 86 million pairs of shoes to people who need them, 86 million pairs of shoes. Mother Teresa said, we belong to each other. Just like the birth team for my sister, we get to be the light bringers for each other. We are each other's angels right here on earth. Now, we don't have to create a big company like Tom's. We don't have to. We can, but we don't have to do that. We have a myriad of opportunities every day of how we are going to show up with our light, our inner light, the energy that we bring, noticing those in need, and perhaps allowing ourselves to illuminate their light for them in whatever way we can. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, Earth is crammed with heaven. Isn't that yummy? Earth is crammed with heaven. There are so many ways that we can be the light for others when they need it. So many wonderful organizations doing such great work. You know, you can volunteer or support in whatever way that works for you. I mean, we have literally right out here on the, the courtyard, the Helping Hands Ministry does such good work in the world. They've got that giving tree. What a great thing. What a great thing. There's so many opportunities for us to shine our light. And as we move into this season of light, this holiday season, the metaf metaphysical birth of the light, I am reminded of the powerful story of the journey of the Magi, the story of the group of people who saw a star in the night sky, which represented the light of love of God, and they traveled many, many miles facing the unknown, despite what would have been great threats at the time, possible scary terrain, they traveled following that star, a political unstable environment, politically unstable environment. They still followed so many muddy streams they had to follow, but they didn't give up. They stayed the course. They followed the light out of the darkness, and they were forever changed. This is our call. So the word Hanukkah actually means dedication. So I am going to, on this first night of Hanukkah, invite all of us to dedicate ourselves to allowing, allowing the inner light of love to lead us out of any challenge or seeming cave or darkness that we are moving through or experiencing, and to let the light of love, this light, give us strength for whatever it is that we may be called to bring into the world, to look for and seek out the eye in the eye, and to shine our light of love to any of the people and places in the world that need it in whatever way that shows up in front of us. And in this way, we together, as members of this human family, can participate in creating a world that works for everyone. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. What a blessing it is to sense and feel and know this presence of the divine love that is right here. This inner light that illuminates our path, that lights the way for each and every one of us. And I speak my word for each one of us knowing that this prayer right here in this moment is a beacon of light and love to any place in the world that may be calling for it right now. 
And in this prayer, we include our family, our friends, our loved ones, knowing that this light is a healing salve for them in whatever way supports and uplifts their life. For we know that we are all connected. And what a blessing it is on this beautiful Sunday to bless all churches everywhere, mosques, ashrams, synagogues, temples, circles, paths, all paths to God, knowing we are all one in this one life. I give so much thanks for this knowing, and I release my word into the law of divine mind, into that infinite sacred yes, knowing it is done. We are loved, it is good. And so it is, amen.